Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Temple. We're so happy that you're joining us online today. Once again, um, I'm Keith Hart. I'm one of the youth coordinators here at CT. And I'm Megan Mays. We're so happy you guys are able to join us for this morning. I'm sure some of you are wondering what exactly we have here going on today, but it actually ties into Pastor's sermon today. I really enjoyed his sermon last week about um, just starting a fire and just spreading um, the love of God across the world. But today we're going to talk about the element of understanding and how we can't judge others. We need to first understand. Hopefully you joined us last week um, for part one of the series about forgiveness. Uh, it was a great message and we really enjoyed it. I know I sure did. Um, but this week we're driving into part two and we're super excited about it. And hopefully today's message can speak to you as well. So before we get into the game that illustrates what pastor's message is all about today, we're gonna pray. Can you bow your heads with us? Lord, I thank you so much that you're ever present, Lord God, and you're with us no matter where um, anyone's watching right now, Lord God. I thank you so much for that. And I pray that in this whole service, Lord God, that you would just continue to be with us, that you would reveal stuff to us through what pastor says, Lord, and through every single part of this um, this message, Lord, in this service. Um, I pray that you just help us this week, Lord God, and you help us to internalize this message and just use it throughout the entire week. It's your night prayer. Amen. So what are we doing today, Megan, with these eggs? <laughs> well, basically, we're going to play a game called Egg Roulette, which is where we smash eggs on our heads for your entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely uh, youth ministry for you. Um, that's how we got wrapped into this. But actually, this does illustrate Pastor's um, sermon today. It's a good game for it. There's 12 eggs here, nine of them are hard boiled, and three of them are not. So they're gonna make a lot more of a mess, and we cannot tell which one is which. Um, and so it's all about our judgment today. And um, it's a good illustration for his message that you'll see in a little bit here to come, but. Let's hope we choose wisely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll ever be. <laughs> All right, let's rock, paper, scissors. Who goes first, right? All right. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Ooh. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. No! <laughs> let's go. Uh, this is so nerve-wracking. <laughs> Jesus, help me. All right, moment of truth. Ooh. I don't know how to. Just oh, dive in. no. Just dive in. <laughs> I made a mistake. Oh. No. One down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Your turn. <laughs> First pick. That stinks. <laughs> Man, I have a. All right. Bad um, luck. <laughs> we're going with the corner egg. Just dive right in. Let's go. Uh. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay, you want to hear some jokes while we're sure. doing this? All right. What do you call an egg that lives in a city of 20 million people? <laughs> I don't know. New York City. <laughs> That's such a bad joke. They're so bad. <sighs> All right, Jesus, really two help me two. out here. No. <laughs> I'll try a corner one. Ow, that hurts. <laughs> All right, we'll stick with the four corners, you know? All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Dove into that egg. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the day of the week eggs hate the most? I don't know. Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Megan with the dad jokes. <laughs> Seriously. Go. <laughs> Megan's taking L's out here. L. <laughs> no, Jesus did not help me out today. <laughs> you have to listen to Pastor Sermon extra hard. I right? think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think All so. All right, sticking with the four corners. Um. Ooh, my gosh. <laughs> Why do you do it I'm so hard? Knock myself out with these eggs. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, how so does it? Three for three. All right. Maybe it's my jokes that give me bad luck. How does uh, an egg get off the highway? Uh, On the exit. I think you deserve a not horrible one after that joke. <laughs> no, man, that's hard to crack. 
Alright, <laughs> my four corner strategy is done. Now I don't know what to do. Choose the middle. Alright, green means go. <laughs> Let's go! Killing it out here. Right. What did the egg say when I was meditating? I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I told stupid. you I came prepared for jokes. So stupid. <laughs> Oh, we're good. Ooh, oh, I looked empty. That's <laughs> that my hair look. Piggy. All right, this one's lonely. Oh, oh no. <laughs> How? Uh, How? I actually couldn't tell if that one was not hard welded or not at first, but. This is the. Ooh. I feel like I'm like a golfer, like trying to figure out like the best angle right now. We should just both go at the same time. Alright. You get your pick though. <sighs> I don't want to pick. <laughs> oh my gosh. Down to the final two. <laughs> I can't feel. I'm just going to pick one. Alright, on three. Okay. Well, on one I guess. <laughs> three, two, one. Let's go! Let's go! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> she took all three of them. This is <laughs> Get ready to worship. <laughs> oh man. Don't scramble away now.
joining us online today at Calvary Temple. Today we're going to look at a, a, a very interesting subject and it reminded me when I watched Keith and Megan doing that opener, reminded me how much this relates to what we're going to talk about today. Such a fun opener anyway. But uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2 in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to talk about the element of understanding and, I, and sometimes it's hard to understand things. Everything that goes on, the world that we're living in. And this COVID-19 thing is one of those that, that a good example of that. Uh, you know, people are going and getting tested. The numbers seem to be going up here lately in the last few weeks. And it kind of reminded me of one man who takes his wife to get tested. Several days go by and he receives a call from the doctor. The doctor tells him over the phone, hey, due to an unfortunate mix-up with the lab, we're not sure if your wife has COVID-19 or Alzheimer's. Now, the man is clearly frustrated at this point. He asked the doctor, he said, well, what am I supposed to do with that kind of information? Well, the doctor calmly suggests to him, well, I recommend that you take her for a very long walk and leave her. If she comes home, don't let her in. Hey, don't judge me. I saw that on the internet. Thought it was kind of funny and kind of connects with what we're dealing with right now. Matthew chapter seven, look at me at verses one and two. Do not judge others so that God will not judge you. For God will judge you in the same way you judge others. And he will apply to you the same rules you apply to others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this incredible passage of teaching that you gave to us while you were here on this earth, Jesus. And we ask that we would apply it to our hearts, that we would get to that place where we, we develop understanding for one another. Lord, speak through this mouthpiece today challenge us to grow more and more like you in every way. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in the second week of a series of messages that I've entitled Start a Fire. Now, this particular series is about lighting a fire for a better world. It's, it's taking the first step to create a, a positive change in those folks that are around us. We're looking at five reciprocal actions or elements that Jesus has called us to take. Now, these elements are actually like seeds that we plant in the ground. They grow, they sprout, they bloom. You know, the more we do these things, the more we spread these actions around, the more they come back our way. It's the law of the harvest that you've heard me preach about so many times. The things that we do tend to come back our way. When we do these things, we plant seed and it comes back 
in, in a way of a harvest to us. Now, last week we talked about the element of forgiveness. You remember the phrasing in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Jesus taught us to pray and he said, and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Or as the Good News translation puts it, forgive us the wrongs that we have done as we forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. Listen, if we want to walk in the fullness of God's forgiveness, then we forgive because we've been forgiven by God's grace. Now today we're talking about another fire-starting reciprocal action that we need to get in the habit of spreading around to others. This one is actually found in Matthew chapter 7. Now most people, even those that are not affiliated with the church, have heard these words before. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Now, I gotta tell you, I grew up in the warm and fuzzy 70s where you know everything was about love and peace and groovy man. And, 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 and this was something of a mantra for us, really. Don't judge me, and I won't judge you. Don't judge me, and I won't judge you. You. Now, in those days, to those that, that, that were outside of the church anyway, Christianity was seen as really the most judgmental organization in the world. And while the rest of the world was saying, oh, do your own thing, hey, if it feels good, do it, you know, we Christians were oftentimes accused of trying to impose our arbitrary standard of morality on everybody else. Now, this has changed somewhat in recent years. It's actually now become America's pastime to pass judgment on anyone and everyone who doesn't adhere to our rigid new morality, the way that we think, the way that we believe, the way that we feel about something. For example, if you support the wrong group or if you have the wrong political opinion or if it can be documented that you know, you've done anything wrong in your life, you can expect to be shamed and criticized and culturally canceled on social media. As in, how dare you think not think like the rest of us think? And how dare you not be as good as the rest of us? Now, I won't get into the specifics, and I certainly don't want today's message to get political because there's plenty of you know one-on-one -on -one judgmentalism that's taking place on the individual level in our world. But this judgmental attitude is wreaking havoc in our relationships, and it can wreak havoc within our church and within our community as well. Some of you are thinking right now, Pastor Scott, I don't judge other people. I mean, unless... I know that they're, what they're doing is sinning unless I know what they're doing or what they're thinking is wrong. And then don't I have a right to judge them? Because, I mean, the Bible judges them, right? But you know, in Romans chapter two, it tells us that you may think that you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say that they are wicked and should be punished, then you, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same things. Listen, all of us have sinned and we have no excuse. I love the way it's written in the message in Romans chapter two, verse one. Every time you criticize someone, you condemn yourself. It takes one to know one. Judgmental criticism of others is a well-known way of escaping detection of your own crimes and misdemeanors. You know, even the apostle Peter, after he had denied Jesus Christ three times on the night of Jesus's betrayal, when Jesus later confronted him about it after he had resurrected from the dead, Peter at that moment began to deflect his own fault by pointing to another disciple and asked Jesus, hey, what about him? What about him? Listen, it is so easy to judge other people about the very things that we do ourselves and we judge ourselves through rose-colored glasses and we look at everyone else through a magnifying glass. You know, a judgmental mind focuses on what is wrong with others rather than on what is right. Being judgmental simply means that we make it a habit to find fault, usually in some sort of nitpicking manner, but we find fault with another individual or another group of individuals. Another way to say it is that being judgmental means that your go-to response is to look down on another person based primarily on what you think that you know. For example, have you ever heard of Susan Boyle? Today, she's an accomplished professional singer. She first appeared on uh, Britain's Got Talent and, and literally she took the judges by surprise. Stories like hers, though, have become a YouTube staple. A an aspiring musician 
takes the stage looking rather unimpressive, to say it charitably, and the judges just know, you know, based on appearances, what they think they're going to be able to expect from this person's performance. You can often detect subtle mockery in their opening interview. And then when the aspiring musician begins to sing, it turns out that they really do have talent and the judges are blown away and YouTube blows up. Now that's what happened to Susan Boyle. I mean, you would never guess by looking at her or, or more specifically by listening to her talk in the, her you know, thick Scottish brogue that, that, that she can sing like she can sing. I mean, after her stunning performance on Britain's Got Talent, she has gone on to record seven studio albums and has performed all over the world. You know, she serves as a reminder of why that we should be careful not to make snap judgments of others. Listen, we don't just prejudge people, though, based on how much talent they may or may not have. We have a tendency to prejudge others in many areas as well. For example, we judge people in the way that they dress or in the way that they talk or the kind of car they drive. We judge people, you know, by the kind of job they have or, or, or that they don't have a job at all. We oftentimes judge them as lazy and irresponsible when they don't have a job. Or if their children misbehave just one time, we assume that their child always misbehaves and we assume, you know, that they're not good parents. I mean, we have a tendency to make snap judgments about others based on nothing more than misperceptions and misconceived ideas. And these snap judgments cause us to look down on others unfairly. And if we're really honest, we often use these snap judgments as a justification to feel better about ourselves. Now, let me just say in the first half of this message, I want us to consider three reasons why we have no right to judge anyone. I mean, if you feel a sense of judgment coming on, these three statements will remind you to get back on track because you have no right to judge because first of all, we don't know enough to pass judgment. We do not know enough to pass judgment. For example, when God blessed Marcia and I with four beautiful children, we felt led to homeschool those children. Now, people acted as if we were weird or crazy to want to home educate our children. But over and over, I remember as my children were growing up, people would say to my kids, I can't believe you're homeschooled. I mean, you're, you seem so normal. I mean, people would just assume that because my kids are homeschooled, that they are somehow weird or socially awkward. But my children are incredibly normal. They also have 10 college degrees between the four of them. But people who judged us for homeschooling simply did not have enough information about homeschooling to pass judgment on us. And see, we think that, that just merely taking a surface level scan of a situation, we can know all that we need to know, but that's very rarely the case. In fact, just a, a couple of weeks ago, it was reported that somebody had placed a noose in NASCAR driver Bubba Wallace's garage. Now, because Bubba Wallace is partially black, it was assumed that this was a racial crime and, and, and people who heard about it were outraged. Thankfully, when it was investigated, it was discovered that the rope that looked somewhat like a noose was actually a hoist, and it had been there for several years. And millions of millions of people jumped to a very quick conclusion about what they thought they knew, even though in a fairly short amount of time, that story completely unraveled. And I gotta tell you, this has happened again and again and again, especially during the last few years. Everybody wants to get the jump on a juicy story, and then we judge too quickly without enough facts to know what's real or what's the truth. And we get partial information or, or even get wrong or misleading information and we think that we know the truth. So we think that we know enough to pass judgment on a situation or you know that we know enough to pass judgment on others, but the truth of the matter is that most of the time, we just don't have enough information at our disposal to make that call. You know, another example of this that I can think of happened to my wife, Marcia, when she was in 10th grade. You see, prior to going on a week's vacation, her teacher had given assignments and instructions for the week that she was going to be gone. She told the class that she expected all the work to be done and to be turned in before she returned the following Monday. Unfortunately, Marcia's dad passed away only a few days later, and she missed the next week of school. Well, the following Monday rolled around and both Marcia and the teacher were back in class. And the teacher began to go through the assignments and she noticed that Marcia had not turned in any of the assignments. 
And so in front of the entire class, she went on a rant that Marsha, who, by the way, was a straight A student, ranked number three in the class of almost 500 students, but that Marsha apparently didn't care enough about this class or, or her grade for that matter to do the assignments and turn them in. Well, when she finally stopped going on and on and on with her tirade, she asked Marsha what she had to say for herself. Marsha, through her tears, told the teacher that her father had passed away and she had been dealing with his death and the funeral. Well, the teacher's face turned pale and she was very embarrassed and she apologized for misjudging Marcia. Oh, by the way, she gave Marcia an A for all the assignments that she hadn't turned in because of the situation. But you know, part of the problem is that Americans today think that they have to have an opinion on everything that we have to make a judgment on everything. And many times we don't know enough about the situation to pass judgment. Now let me clarify by saying that it's okay to have a, an opinion and it's okay for us to have different opinions, but you need to just remember that it's only an opinion. It's only an opinion. In fact, my dad used to make a statement. He'd say opinions are like noses. Everybody has one. But the truth of the matter is we don't have to have an opinion on everything. It's okay to say, I don't know enough about this topic. I think I'll wait for more facts to come in before I decide what's truth. Brett Jones, just a week ago, made this statement. He said, I find it ironic that during the first pandemic in generations, social media should have been the thing that helped us connect and, and pull together, fill the void of the loss of human connection. Instead, it's only driven us further apart. We can't pass judgment on situations and other people because many times we just simply do not have enough information to come to a correct conclusion. So here's another reason why we have no right to judge. Number two, we aren't objective enough to pass judgment. We're not objective enough to pass judgment. William Barclay says that it's been told that when the Greeks held a particularly important, difficult trial, that they held it in the dark so that the judge and the jury would not even see the man on trial and would therefore be influenced by nothing but the facts on the case. I mean, have you ever been watching, a, say, a football game and there's a play that's just too close to call? I mean, even with instant replay, it's really difficult to tell what the outcome should be. I mean, you really can't tell quite it, it, whether the, the receiver had possession of the ball before they stepped out of bounds. I mean, it can be interpreted either way. Well, the officials sometimes even have a hard time coming to a conclusion. But I gotta tell you, it's easy for me. How do I know how to make the call? It's easy. If it's in my team's favor, then the player was in bounds, and so it should be ruled a catch. If it's in the other team's favor, then he was out of bounds, and it's incomplete. I'll have to admit that when it comes to these judgment calls, maybe, maybe I'm a little biased. Maybe I lack, you know, objectivity. Maybe. But what, what about when your friend or your child is in a conflict with another person? I mean, somebody that you don't know. How will that influence your perception of the conflict? It's tough to be objective, isn't it? In fact, I would say that most of the time, it's literally impossible to be fully objective because we all have our biases and these biases color our perception. When you're tempted to judge a, another person or a particular situation, you need to make it a point to remind yourself that I am not nearly as objective as I think that I am. Every person has a right to have an opinion, but we should really keep that opinion to ourselves. I mean, unless I guess sharing that opinion has a positive use, and then we need to remember that when we share our opinion, that we do so in a non-judgmental way. I tell you, social media and 24-hour-a-day news channels causes us to have access to, to so much that, that many times we don't slow down and process what's being said, and we, we jump to conclusions. And then we think that our opinion is the only one that matters and is the only one that's right. You know, a good example of this, I guess, would be the, the current COVID-19 situation and the wearing a mask. I mean, some people think that if we, if we will all wear a mask all the time, that we could eradicate this virus very quickly. Other people feel that wearing a mask is literally a waste of time and it's an infringement on their personal rights. And so if you feel a certain way, you're not gonna be objective with someone who feels the opposite way. But the truth is that we really aren't objective enough to pass judgment in these situations. Now, here's the third reason, though, why we have no right to judge. Number three, we're not good enough to pass judgment. 
You remember the story found in John chapter eight when the religious leaders brought a, a woman to Jesus and they threw her at his feet and they said in John chapter eight, verse four and five, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? No doubt, remember what Jesus said in verse seven. If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, what happened next? Well, the accusers begin leaving one by one. Now, this story, I think, should be all that we need to break the judging others habit forever. None of us are qualified to sit in the judgment seat because none of us are without sin. I mean, we sometimes try to qualify our qualification by saying, well, of course I'm not perfect, but at least I never did that. Now we say that as if our sins are so much more honorable than the sins of somebody else's. Or, you know, the, the ugly truth is that sin is sin. And none of us come into the picture with clean hands, except by the grace of God. We have all sinned. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, and we are all in need of God's grace. And that's why in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Who are you to judge your neighbor? In fact, in Romans chapter 14, verse 10, that's why the apostle Paul said, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Paul said again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Listen, on that day when we're called to give an account of our life, you can be sure that there is one answer that's not going to be acceptable, and that is the answer that begins with, well, at least I never. Listen, if you've been caught in the trap of judging others, I'm not going to judge you for it. But I am going to tell you, in the, in the time that we have remaining today, I want to give you three keys of breaking the cycle of judging others. And it is about the element of understanding. It's about understanding one another. The first key is, number one, you have to have an attitude of humility. Have an attitude of humility. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse three, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. You know, sometimes we need to put ourselves in, in our place, don't we? None of us have the right to throw the first stone. There are times when we need to just do a reality check in our own life. Who am I? I'm nobody. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. So don't think too highly of yourself. In other words, be humble. Have an attitude of humility. The second thing that we need, the second key, is to have an attitude of empathy. You know, more than 2,000 years ago, the rabbi Halil said, do not judge a man until you yourself have come into his circumstances or situation. In fact, there's an old saying that many of you I'm sure have heard that goes this way, don't judge a man until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Now I'm gonna tell you, the, the admonition to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes basically means that before judging someone, you must fully understand his experiences, his challenges, his thought processes and such. In fact, the full idiom is this, before you judge a man, walk a mile in his shoes. In effect, it is a reminder that we are to practice empathy. We're to practice sympathy. I love the way Emo Phillips said. He said, never judge someone until you walked a mile in his shoes. That way, when you do judge him, you're a mile away and you have his shoes. The Native Americans used to say, don't judge a man until you've walked two moons in his moccasins. In other words, they were saying, don't judge or condemn a person until you have experienced for at least two months the kind of life that person leads. Now, though there are exceptions, most of us could say that our best qualities are the result of the advantages that we are given in life. And many people's worst qualities are the result of the disadvantages that they grew up with. Now, as I said, there are exceptions, but if you will make an attempt to enter into the other person's experience, I'm talking about to feel what they feel, to see the world the way they see the world, then you'll be able to overcome a judgmental attitude. That's why the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 13, verse three says, continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourself were suffering. 
So we need to take an attitude of empathy toward others. And then thirdly, the third thing that we need to do is we need to have an attitude of grace. Have an attitude of grace. Now, last week I quoted the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, when he said, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Show the same mercy to others that God has shown to you. Offer to others the second chance that God's offered to you. In other words, extend to others the very same benefit of the doubt that you want God to extend to you because God has poured out his grace upon you so now you can pour out his grace upon others. That's why God loves you and treats you the way he does. That's why he shows his grace to you so that you can bless others, not judge them, but come into a place of understanding them. So in closing, let me just say the ancient rabbinic teaching was that there are six works that give a man credit in this life and in the life to come. Those six words are study, visiting the sick, hospitality, devotion and prayer, teaching children the law of God, and thinking the best of other people. Now this was considered a key element of righteous living. The ancient Jewish teaching was that kindness in in, in judgment is nothing less than a sacred duty of one, oneself. And so rather than assuming the worst in others, our challenge is to think the best of others. You ignite the element of understanding when you choose to see others in the best possible light. Now this doesn't mean that no one's held accountable for their words or that you completely ignore destructive behavior. It just means that you show others the same grace, the same kindness, the same mercy that you hope to receive from God. And do you know what happens when you withhold judgment and instead you extend the gift of understanding? Two things happen. First, more mercy comes your way. You receive more mercy. And then secondly, the element of understanding, I'm talking about the spark of empathy, has the power to just grow in the life of others. You see, we live in a judgmental world and and you can't change everybody all at once, but you can change the way that you relate to others. So let's find a way to believe the best in others and to see the best in others. Let's find a way to come to a place of understanding, to be more understanding of others and less judgmental. Today, I wanna ask if you've never opened your heart or life to Jesus Christ, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And so before I pray in just a moment, I want to make sure that I let you know that Jesus Christ loves you so much. He didn't judge you, but he came to this earth to offer his life to pay the price for your sin so that you could be forgiven, so that you could have a relationship with God once again, so that you could have a fresh start, a second chance. You see, God's not trying to judge you. God is trying to bring you into his presence by the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. If you've never opened your heart or life to receive Jesus, I want you just to say this after me. Say, dear Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I want to live for you. I thank you for a second chance. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to be sure and and, and let us know in the the comment section. We would love to connect with you. If you have a prayer request or any, any need that you have, be sure and put that in the comment section too so that we can pray and agree with you. We want to see you grow. We want to, we want to just help you to be everything that God has for you. Don't forget today to be more understanding of others and less judgmental. That's how we start the spark that burst into a fire that begins to blaze throughout our world. So I wanna encourage you to do that in your daily prayer to ask God to help you to be less judgmental and more understanding with others. Father, I thank you today for this incredible time that we've had together. Now, Lord God, I ask you to bless us, help us to, to not be judgmental of others and situations, but Lord, to be understanding. Lord, to be able to speak peace and love and your mercy and grace into situations, to be able to connect with others in a way that will start a fire, not only in our life and in our, our, our close circle of friends, but in our community and in our world. And we just give you the praise and glory for it because, Lord, we're asking you to bring a fire of revival of your spirit around this world. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. We look forward to seeing you again next week. 